your both your father and ERB, which for those at home, for some reason, Edgar Rice Burroughs, you only refer to them as either Edgar Rice Burroughs or ERB. Any idea why you don't just say Edgar Burroughs? I don't know. Well, you don't <laughs> want to say Burroughs because he might be talking about William Burroughs. Yes, <laughs> that would, you can't do that either. That would be very strange. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know why. He liked. He must have liked the, the, the middle name. And the pomposity of it, the Edgar Rice Burroughs. <laughs> <laughs> well, my father was what my father was often called by his middle name, Eric. So maybe uh, maybe Edgar Rice was often called Rice. I don't know. Hmm. You know, I don't know. I do not know the answer, actually. <laughs> <laughs> but you do know a lot. You do know a lot. <laughs> and I think the best way to approach it, since we've got that river of culture idea, is start with Edgar Rice Burroughs. And then move to your father, then move to you, because the influences started with ERB and have passed down through the rest of us. And whether you think you're influenced by Edgar Rice Burroughs or not, dear viewer, if you're involved in any role playing games, you probably are. If you've read any sci fi or fantasy, you probably are influenced by that man. So, uh, Chris, what drew you and your father to Edgar Rice Burroughs in the first place? Before we get into the deep dive of, of the man himself and his works, what hooked you? Well, I guess we both discovered him when we were children. My father discovered him at summer camp in Hawaii uh, in the library. He said they had everything that Burroughs had written. Uh, I think my father, yeah, exaggerates most of his stories. So. <laughs> anyway, he was an avid reader, dad was, so he had, he had read most of the Tarzan, Palustar, and Mars books when he was, by the time he was a teenager. And then he got to meet Edgar S. Burroughs in Honolulu when Burroughs was staying there about the time that World War II started. I think my, my father associated Burroughs with his childhood, and so he wanted to share that with his children. So he read them aloud to my brother and me, and uh, we started with the Pellucidar series because I love dinosaurs so much. And we had all the great covers on the Ace paperbacks. So we did uh, we did the Pellucidar series, and then we did most of the Mars series. And I think I finished the Mars series on my own because at that time I was uh, a teenager and could read them myself. But that's why we got into it. I think it's a great age for Burroughs. I, it's okay to read them as an adult. There's no shame there. He does occasionally bring in an adult theme or two. But it's very, very kid-friendly reading. Some people say, I mean, because... It was written in the early 20th century. Some, you know, the language is difficult, but I disagree. I think the language is super easy. And you learn a few words, but um, he's very easy to read. And he's very hard to stop reading once you start. You want to keep on turning the pages. That's good. In the interview with Chris Clark, we were talking about Gary Gygax and his writing style. And <laughs> he has a, the high Gygaxian method of <laughs> writing. And a lot of people find that difficult to penetrate but once you catch the rhythm of it it's super easy to follow along and you can see all the different tricks he plays with it and so same thing with the uh, erb huh yeah well I, <laughs> the same thing with Shakespeare. maybe yeah yeah Gag gagax has taught me a few words and so <laughs> that's all that most pulp writers have <laughs> <laughs> yeah i think those... gagax could have been edited a little more i don't think there was an editor there, you know, he, he was it. So uh, yeah. all of his, all of his stuff could be a little shorter. <laughs> yeah. And as we're going to cover in more depth uh, a little bit later on, yes, there's a reason I said that your father was the most important editor in the history of Dungeons mm -hmm. and Dragons. Now to stick with ERB, can you give us a brief overview of his life and like, you know, just mm -hmm. something to orient us to the man. So when we get to talk about his works and some episodes from his life, we, we have the proper context. Well, I'm very bad with dates. That's okay. Insert, <laughs> just look up the dates if you need them. <laughs> but he was a, a, a failure at most of what he attempted. I think he had he had some money and a little military training. You, did he go to a famous military school on the East Coast? Anyway, he tried being a cowboy. I remember people like talking about that. He read a pulp story. I wish we knew which, what it was, but apparently it was so terrible that he couldn't believe that anyone had been paid to write it. So because he was out of work at the time, he tried his hand at writing it. And right off the bat, he wrote uh, Under the Moons of Mars, which became the Princess of Mars. He pretty much wrote his masterpiece uh, as his first attempt. 
<laughs> and he wrote half of it, I guess. And the editors said, we'll finish it and then we'll print it, which is a terrible, terrible business plan. You should always finish what you're going to try to sell. <laughs> so um, he was he was very talented and just didn't know it until he tried. And he was very lucky to find an editor who had a little patience with him. And then his second attempt wasn't that great. It was, a, I am a barbarian, a historical novel set in Caligula's time. It's not, I don't recommend it. Unless you're into Roman history, perhaps. I, I happen to be. I might, I might be. Yeah. Or if you're and a then I guess it's, and you just have to read everything that read the man wrote. That's a big assignment with Burroughs. <laughs> I don't want to put that on anyone. But I guess Tarzan was his third or fourth attempt, and that was a huge hit. He uh, exploited it. He uh, sold it to com to the comics page, and he uh, sold it to toy companies, and he sold it to the movies and the serials. Some people told him that was a bad idea, but obviously it was a great idea. Nobody got sick of Tarzan. He wrote one Tarzan novel a year and one other additional novel a year for most of his life. It was a crazy, crazy prolific guy. When I was doing my research on him, was it something along the lines of 82 individual Tarzan stories? is what i think it's I so. yeah. I mean, <laughs> a heck of a lot to live with any character but if it's if it's paying the bills i see the incentive to do it but at a certain point i gotta wonder do you just run out of material but apparently he didn't feel like he was <laughs> yeah he, he may have gotten sick of it i'm not sure i'm not a uh, yeah i'm not a biographer of him <laughs> <laughs> uh, just a fan yeah, he's a I, master of the cliffhanger. He's a master of the sort of tropes that we're all maybe a little tired of, but the, you know, save, save the princess, get captured, befriend your fellow prisoners, make a crazy escape plan, the Deus Ex Machina ending that you should have seen coming. Sometimes he surprises us with that. I think of him as the grandfather of pulp writing. I think I mentioned in another interview, he, I think he, everybody loved him except H.P. Lovecraft and J.R. Tolkien. All the other writers we think of, uh, especially Robert E. Howard, were, were very influenced by him. Yeah, and I believe the other interview you're talking about is uh, with Shane Stacks over on his YouTube channel. And it's, the interview is well worth your listen, dear viewer and, uh, and listener. But we're going to cover slightly different topics than what Shane did. So I believe Shane focused more on games and the game aspect, whereas we're going to be talking more literary and personal interest kind of stuff. I mean, we're still going to talk about games, but... Don't forget Shane Stacks. It was a good interview. I, I did enjoy listening to it. <laughs> Thank and you. It helped, helped convince me that, yes, I want to talk to this guy and I want to hear more about everything that's on his mind. Yeah, I got that quote that you referenced about Burroughs seeing uh, or reading something particularly awful. And I believe it goes, if people were paid for writing rot such as I read in some of those magazines, that I could write stories just as rotten. As a matter of fact, although I had never written a story, I knew absolutely that I could write stories just as entertaining and probably a whole lot more so than any I chanced to read in those magazines. So from this moment of disdain for the, <laughs> this run-of-the-mill, just throw it on the page to sell product story that got published, he went on to become one of the most prolific and best-selling authors in history. So yeah. you never know. If you just get mad one time, and decide to do something with that anger, <laughs> you could change the course of history. <laughs> yeah. Actually, my father was somewhat inspired by an English teacher who told him he could never be a writer because his penmanship was so bad. Because in those days, in the, in the 30s, I guess that might have been, penmanship was a supposedly important tool for the writer. <laughs> sure. Yeah. <laughs> and then he went on to do, uh, your dad went on to do amazing things in academic fields, in literary fields, in the role-playing field. So yeah, maybe he had a little bit of motivation from that. That's awesome. 